All right, well, it's 12.01 by my clock, so I am going to go ahead and kick off today's webinar. So good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar is about opportunities for healthcare sector organizations looking to add student talent. Thank you for being here. My name is Jenny Nelson and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I know that we're all joining from different areas across British Columbia, even across Canada. So this is an opportunity to acknowledge the various territories we are all joining from. I'm in Victoria, BC, the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, also known as the Songhees Esquimalt First Nations, on whose land I am a visitor and have the privilege to live, work and play. And I hope you joining me in, in acknowledging the lands that you're all joining from as well. Today's webinar has been coordinated through the Association of Cooperative Education and Work Integrated Learning, or ACEWIL. ACEWIL is an association for will practitioners at 25 public post-secondary institutions in BC and the Yukon, and I currently have the honor of serving as the president of this association. I'm also a co-op coordinator at the University of Victoria in the Faculty of Social Sciences, and I've been with UVic Co-op for 16 years, on the board of ACEWIL for the past five years, and I've been serving as the president since May 2019. ACEWIL provides resources and professional development for our members, and we work to promote work integrated learning to students, employers, and community partners. We also work closely with government to advocate for WILL programs and funding. Today, we have a great group assembled to provide you with insight on how to access student talent in order to revitalize or pivot your business. I'll start by giving you a quick primer on work integrated learning, and then we'll uh, hear from our two industry professionals, Rebecca Barr, RTNM, Functional Imaging, PET CT from BC Cancer, and Cheyenne Baines, Coordinator, Injury Prevention, Clinical Quality and Patient Safety from the Fraser Health Authority. They'll share how they've worked with Will students and their tips for success. We'll also hear from two of our federal government's delivery partners for the Student Work Placement Program, what we in post-secondary affectionately refer to as SWIP. We have Jim Babcock and Pamela Gray. Uh, Pamela is the Vice President of Program Development with BioTalent Canada, and Jim is the Project Manager for Early, Early Talent Initiatives with Magnet. They'll um, join us to talk about the new funding uh, and explain how their programs work. To wrap things up, we'll share a few resources that may be helpful to you. We'll also have time to answer your questions. During today's webinar, you have access to the chat, so you can see that there now, uh, where you can share who you are, where you're from, and you can also interact with the other attendees. If you'd like to ask questions of the panelists, please do so in the Q&A. We'll be focused on, on what's in the question and answer uh, area of the webinar, and we may miss a question that's added to the chat. So please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. For those of you that are new to working with Will students, I just wanna start things off with a uh, high level overall view of Will. Work Integrated Learning, what we call WILL for short, refers to work that's designed in partnership between a workplace, a post-secondary institution, and a student. It meets specific standards that are relevant to the student's field of study. There are many different types of work integrated learning. Some are more commonly known, like co-op, apprenticeships, practicums, internships. Uh, these are familiar to many of us. But there's also some lesser known types of WILL, like applied research, entrepreneurship, and community-based learning. What this means is that there's multiple ways for your organization to work with a WILL student. Some placements are longer in duration, like four to eight months. Um, some are even longer than that, potentially up to a year or even more, and the student earns a wage or a salary. So that's typical in co-op or internships. Other placements can be very short. For example, a few weeks in rotation through a specific facility. Many positions are paid positions. Some, however, are not but all are part of a structured academic program where the student is not able to graduate until they've met the will requirements of their program. Based on this, it's really important for you to know that when you bring in a will student, you'll be working closely with staff at a post-secondary institution. This ensures that whatever will experience you're offering not only meets your business needs, but also the student's needs and the program requirements. The positive effect of this is that the business benefits from having the skills, energy, and drive of a student, and the student benefits by applying their classroom learning to real work environments. They're able to contribute in a meaningful way, and the work experience helps them prepare for their career ahead. Colleges and universities also benefit. Um, we gather feedback from businesses and students to ensure that our programs are offering in-demand skills to help students succeed and to help uh, the economy and businesses succeed as well. So we're glad that you're here today to learn more about Will and how it might work for your organization. Before we get to our panelists, I'd just like to share how things are going for Will in the midst of the pandemic. Obviously, we've all been impacted greatly by COVID-19. While some businesses have seen this as an opportunity to rethink their business and welcome a student perspective, others have put their plans for hiring students on hold. SFU and UBC have shared that their co-op placements were down by about 20% heading into the fall. With other types of will, for example, internships in tourism and hospitality, the impacts have been far more severe. 
employers have been cautious, which isn't surprising given how quickly things can change depending on the directives from the government. Unfortunately, this flux continues now that we're in the midst of the second wave. On the positive side, some businesses have been able to quickly adapt. Last year, many moved to remote work for their Will students and shared positive feedback about how adaptable our students are. For example, in, November, in a November webinar, we learned how students working with Rebalance MD here in Victoria helped Rebalance move quickly to offering live video sessions with their physiotherapy clients. For those who continue to have students working on site, new safety protocols are in place to protect students and others in the workplace. Our panelists will also be able to speak to this today. Uh, so with no further ado, let's meet our industry panelists. I'll let them introduce themselves and tell us how long they've been working with Will students. Rebecca, would you like to kick us off? Sure, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Rebecca and I am a nuclear medicine technologist. I graduated from BCIT a little over 20 years ago. And um, I currently work at BC Cancer in Vancouver where I specialize in a type of nuclear medicine imaging called PET-CT scan. PET-CT is a, is a test that looks for cancer cells in patients. And so my role here as technologist also includes um, student coordinators so I work closely with BCIT to have each of their nuclear medicine students rotate through my department for two weeks as it's part of um, competency for them for graduation in the nuclear medicine program. So that's my role here. Great. Thank, thank you. Cheyenne, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, so as mentioned before, I am the coordinator for falls and injury prevention at Fraser Health, a bit of a mouthful. Um, I graduated in 2018 from SFU in their health sciences department. My story was kind of unique because I actually started off as a co-op student for Fraser Health. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work my way up to being the coordinator. And now I hire co-op students. So part of my role at Fraser Health is injury prevention. So we really focus on seniors and falls prevention. So we host uh, workshops, clinics, presentations and different initiatives to work with uh, to support seniors and of course we have our co-op students that support us in supporting the seniors. Great thanks so much Cheyenne and Rebecca. So just a reminder to our attendees that if you have a question we'd like you to use the Q&A module um, so that we don't miss any of your questions in the chat. Um, I have some questions to kick us off while you think of your burning questions to ask Rebecca and Cheyenne. So to start, if I can ask both of you to elaborate a little bit more on how you came to work with work integrated learning students. Cheyenne, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, for me, it was a little bit um, uh, easy because I started off as a co-op student, like I mentioned. So I was really happy to be a part of the co-op program at SFU. Um, and then when I moved into my role, they had already been hiring co-ops, so I was really happy to kind of transition and take that over for them. And like I said, having been on the co-op side of things, um, I think it gave me a unique perspective into um, how to hire, what to look for, uh, and things like that. Great. Thank you. Rebecca? Um, for me at BCIT, they discovered that the students would be having newer um, competencies due to some new technology in our field. And so with that came um, the need for students to rotate through our department in order to sign off those competencies with this new type of procedure. Um, so my management uh, was uh, contacted by BCIT and asked if we could have students come through. And um, they uh, asked me if I would help with that uh, developing a rotation here, and then also guiding the students through their journey through our department. I did have some experience working with students at a different um, location in Oregon. And so I think I just sort of had an affinity for it and been, been doing it um, other places. So it was an, an easy transition here. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we had a question that came in through the chat just asking where Cheyenne and Rebecca work. So Cheyenne works with Fraser Health Authority and Rebecca works with uh, BC Cancer Agency. Um, we do have a question in the chat for Rebecca. You mentioned that you work with the BCIT Nuclear Medicine Program. Do you take on other students outside of the BCIT program? Um, I have not yet taken on students outside of BCIT programs. I do get rotations of students from other modalities with BCIT. So for example, the radiation therapy students come through and they just spend a day observing. Um, so they're not, they're on a practicum with radiation therapy and then come into the department for observation. Great, thank you. And while uh, we wait for some other questions to come in through the chat, 
I'm wondering if both of you can tell us about the outcomes for the students. Um, for instance, are there any jobs that result from participating in the Work Integrated Learning Program with your organizations? So, uh, Cheyenne, would you like to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, so definitely. So I was a co-op student and that went to being a full-time position for me. Um, I can speak to the co-op student that we had uh, kind of right now. She's half co-op, half not. So we hired her back in May for an eight-month co-op which ended in December but she's been really great and so we were able to keep her on part-time while she finishes her studies now so um, I know at, at my place we have a lot of part-time opportunities available for our previous co-ops um, as well as um, several of the co-ops that um, were in my department have now gone on to other roles in Fraser Health um, and I think that the co-op program really helped them get there. Great thank you how about you Rebecca? Well, for us, we often hire our students as well. Um, we have the advantage that every BCIT nuclear medicine student has to rotate through our department, so we get to meet them all. Um, so their two-week rotation ends up being a lot like an interview. Our staff get a chance to work with them, and uh, we decide if they're a good fit in our department. So really, it is kind of an interview process for both of us. And um, the advantage of having a student is that um, they're job ready by the time, you know, Know, it comes to the hiring time they've already been there and learned the procedure so it uh, does make the orientation to the department a lot easier if they've been through rather than hiring from outside fantastic thank you so much and we have some more questions coming in our chat uh, so can you each comment on how will student placements align with the health sciences placement network also known as hsp net the, that application that's widely used for nursing student placements and to a lesser extent with other clinical disciplines such as OT, physio, et cetera. Cheyenne, looks like you're ready to go. Um, no, I was just gonna say, I think oh. this might be a better question for Rebecca to okay. answer. Um, <laughs> I don't really deal with that side of things. So um, I can touch on it a little bit in that there's this uh, lovely lady named Hina who I've never met in person, who is the PHSA HSP coordinator, that's a mouthful, and um, BCIT and them are linked somehow, and they uh, let Hina know who our students are, and then she emails me, and uh, so she's, for me, she's more just a formality of paperwork that I don't quite understand, <laughs> but it all works smoothly. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, can you also both please comment on how, or share with us how COVID has impacted your ability to accept or facilitate will placements? Yeah, so when the pandemic first hit and we kind of went to our lockdown in March, we put a freeze on hiring initially, just because we didn't know like what things were gonna look like in the upcoming months. Uh, so we held off our placement from May and pushed it until June. Um, I was lucky that we were able to kind of set up a partly remote, partly in office kind of um, situation. Um, and actually, I would say that since I have started having a co-op during the pandemic has actually been the most, ben most beneficial time for us to have a co-op. Um, and that's mainly because there were so many changes going on. So our co-op student actually worked to get rid of all of our paper files um, because our, our programs went online. And so she actually created a database for us that we can now have everything online, which is a lot easier. We can now share things, you know, while working from home. So while in the beginning, it was a bit unknown, I think that especially students um, coming out of school, like they're really eager to learn new things and set up new things. And so my student now has been like instrumental in setting up our COVID uh, safe programs and initiatives. Great, thank you, Cheyenne. Rebecca? We had a similar experience in that everything was on hold in the beginning. So our students that were supposed to come from March to June were postponed. They came over the summer instead once we all had protocols in place, um, both on our end and through BCIT. So there's strict protocols on wearing PPE and coming in or not coming in rather when you're not feeling well. So we have a lot of protocols in place for both of those. And it's gone really smooth. Um, and as uh, Cheyenne mentioned, it is actually really helpful that they're here. It's just one more set of hands to do all the cleaning in between patients. And they are so eager. And uh, sometimes I have to have them back off from cleaning and do other things. <laughs> uh, so it's it's been super helpful. And the pause was great just to get us all organized. But it's been going fine so far. Great. Thank you so much. 
Uh, so I have another question in the chat. I believe this may be a question for me and some of our other attendees. Uh, we are a private home support services company called Spectrum Home and Family Care in the West Kootenays and have a real issue with employee retention as we offer only casual work. Wondering if this might be a good option for us. Um, I'm not sure, Rebecca or Cheyenne, if you'd like to comment on that as well, but I will say from my perspective, I believe that yes, it can be a good option. Uh, there are a lot of different forms of work integrative learning that might be a good fit for your organization. Um, in the West Kootenays, uh, I would encourage any of our attendees that would like to um, work with uh, Spectrum Home and Family Care to uh, talk in the chat or put a message in the chat um, and you may be able to connect. Um, I'm with the University of Victoria and I'd also be uh, happy to connect with you, Tani, um, to talk a little bit about what some options might be um, for working with work integrated learning students. So uh, I encourage people to connect with Tammy in the chat and Rebecca. Yes, I was just going to add, we often only offer casual jobs in the beginning as well. And I find um, what that means for the new employees is that they just have a couple sites that they that they work at. And so it's great because they're still working in the field, even though they're casual, so they have their foot in the door. And then um, once a job becomes available, not only do they have the experience that they've learned at my site, but they bring with them the experience they got working casual from another site. So I think they end up doing just fine. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and then I just wanted to comment that uh, Cheyenne and Rebecca, Pam's from Vancouver Community College says thank you for all of your thoughts. Um, and then uh, Selkirk College has a community health worker program and uh, geronology. So um, if anybody from Selkirk is in the chat, if you'd like to reach out to Pammy, that would be fantastic. Um, and from any of our other schools, uh, that's great too. Um, as I wait for some other questions to come in the chat, it's been fantastic. So many questions coming in. Thank you everyone for, uh, for participating. Um, I'd like to ask what a typical day for your work integrated students look like. Um, so you've already talked a little bit about how they've helped you pivot from COVID-19, but um, typically what have your students worked on? What kinds of things do they do? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think there was also a question in the chat that I noticed, um, but I'll start with this one. So with my co-op student, we run a falls prevention mobile clinic. So one of her main uh, jobs is to do booking and getting seniors ready for their appointments. Um, that has been especially challenging during COVID because our appointments are now online and seniors are not the most tech savvy uh, age group, but it's okay because our co-op is doing a great job of really helping them um, kind of get online, being patient with them, getting them uh, learning how to use their iPads and iPhones and smartphones. Um, she also really does a good job of keeping things up to date. So we do a lot of presentations and stats on falls prevention are always changing. So we use her to update things. Uh, we also keep like running lists of exercise programs and other stuff that she keeps up to date. Um, she also preps for the next co-op. So instead of us having to retrain every time, um, I get the current co-op student, we have like a binder going and she'll make sure that binder is up to date. And then I do try to get them to overlap for a few days as well. So she'll put some of her time doing that. Uh, and then finally, just special projects. So I really like to give the co-op some time like to do what they're interested in. Most of them are coming from health sciences, so they are interested in some kind of public health thing. And so um, try to giving them try to give them the opportunity to do whatever initiatives that they're interested in. Great. Thank you, Cheyenne. Rebecca? So for us, our students are only with us for two weeks. And so on their first day, we do a lot of just orientation um, and discussion of what the goals and outcomes are for the rotation for both myself and for the student. Uh, and just a little details like where do you put your lunch and where's the cafeteria, because those are important. Um, and then I will gradually uh, add in different things until the end of the two weeks, they're able to do the whole um, setup of a patient injecting a radioactive tracer and then doing a scan. Um, I just wanted to share a little story because when I first started, I this was a new program for us here. And uh, I just said, okay, so here we are and go ahead and this is what you're going to do. And, uh, and I found that the students would be nervous about us certain part and usually it was the IV placement and so they would instead of doing a proper patient explanation they would just be worried about it and not do a proper IV and so I realized okay we need to we need to sort of make this into steps and then however fast or slow I can change depending on how uh, how the student's doing but um so now what we do is the first day we just work on explanations and then the next day then we'll add in IVs and then the next day we kind of build on that and I found that that worked knowing that 
I had to do all these pieces with them. And then the, the pace at which we did all the pieces could be um, adjusted. So for me, it was a little bit of a learning a pro uh, program myself, setting it up because I needed to be prepared. And I, um, it, because I'm doing this job on top of already my own job, I have um, like worksheets that we go through. And I, so I have a package for each student on their first day. And we, um, we just go through the package at their own pace, and then they get to take it all home with them. But it helps me stay organized as well, because I don't like being unorganized. <laughs> Right. So yeah, thank you so much. So I have some uh, comment and a question in the chat. So thank you, for Cheyenne, for sharing your experience of having co-op students work with you at Fraser Health. Um, and then another question for Cheyenne is: Our co-op students are required to submit a work term assignment based on the work that they are involved in for their work term. Can you please provide examples of work term assignments that your co-op students would produce at the end of the term? Many students prefer to have their own independent project. Is this an opportunity that your co-op students can take on? Yeah, so um, I can speak to that kind of twofold. When I was a co-op student, I also had to do a work term placement project. And yes, I wanted to do my own and not one of the ones that the uh, co-op office had laid out. Um, for my first one, I was working with hemodialysis patients at Fraser Health. And my final co-op project was to create um, a full data analysis of all of my uh, research findings. So even though Fraser Health had their own research team that was gonna do it properly in all you know, perfectly. Um, my project was to actually get the experience of doing that statistical analysis and all that. Um, my most recent co-op student, her um, work term project was actually what she created for us during uh, COVID. So she uh, used Microsoft Access to create like this massive brand new database, like I mentioned before, that holds all of our information and transferred everything over. So her final project that she can add to her portfolio now is that she's created this absolutely amazing database that has saved my team so much time. Um, at my co-op before that, um, I let her work on an initiative of her choice and she was really interested in um, like skateboarding initiatives. So she did a project um, that involved that and creating a presentation for that. Um, so yeah, it's been uh, a lot of different options that they can kind of do. Great. Thank you so much, Cheyenne. And I have another comment in the chat or in the Q&A for Rebecca. So um, thanks for sharing your story about the, the students and how you orient them. Um, it is good to know that students may need some orientation before they're on their own. That's important to have set up ahead of time. So uh, that is really a, a great story to share. So thank you. Um, let's see if there are any other uh, questions that come in the chat. But uh, until that happens, I've got one final question for the two of you. Um, it's not mandatory for either of your organizations to work with practicum or co-op students. So I'm wondering if each of you can share um, a bit of the overall benefit that the students bring to your workplace. Um, they've, you know, independently, they've done some projects that are really meaningful, but just overall, what value do you see in having students in your business? I think that um, Rebecca mentioned it really well earlier. It's a bit like an interview. So it really helps to you know, Fraser Health to decide who they want to hire and who they want to have as full-time staff. Um, I think part of the value is, you know, you take pride in being able to educate the next workforce that's coming up through university. Um, I know I really appreciated that opportunity as a co-op student. Um, you know, it, it really frees up time and the eagerness and excitement of students um, cannot be like, you know, described as how important it really is. They just bring a whole new dynamic into the workforce with how excited and um, like, they're like sponges that just want to learn everything and help with everything. So it's, it's really great. Thanks. Rebecca? I've also had similar experiences. Um, I, I love learning from the students. Uh, they bring information from other sites that we might not know about being stuck in our little hole that we go to every day. Um, so they just bring some light with them. And uh, now I'm at the age where they're all younger than me. So a little bit of fresh energy. <laughs> and uh, eventually the students are going to be my caregivers one day. So it's nice that I have a role shaping that. Thank you so much. And I've had another question come in the chat. Would you each be able to share an example of a memorable will placement for both you and the student and what made it memorable? Um, I would say that my most current co-op student has been my most memorable. Um, and the reason for that is because as we all know, things have been a bit of a crazy, wild, chaotic storm with the pandemic. And so we were really kind of lost and struggling with what to do. And so I've really gotten to work very closely with my current student in like 
creating new ideas and creating ways to kind of overcome the barriers that are we're being faced with the uh, with the pandemic. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been a very enlightening and fun co-op that we have right now. Great, thank you, Rebecca. It's so hard to pick just one example. Um, they at the end of the two weeks, the majority of them end up being like siblings almost, where you you know you've had this two weeks and you're really close. It's not like you're other co-workers where you come in and you're but you're still doing your own thing the student is with you in your space for that two weeks so they almost end up like family um and then i think for me it's whatever sort of if there's something big that's happened while they were there like i don't know if there was a code or something bad but then you almost even bond more with the student and it, so you remember i think the most memorable one for me and it, it, it this wouldn't happen i'm sure in most places but i had a student faint while i was while I was doing a presentation. It wasn't even when we were doing any patient care stuff. And I didn't know, but they had come over from a lecture somewhere else and hadn't eaten lunch and they were wearing their own coats, lab coats over top. And uh, and yeah, so that was memorable, not in a good way, probably what you don't want to hear that. But <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they become like family. Thank you so much. So uh, I've got a comment and, a, and, a, and another question that I believe may be more for me or our other attendees. So this is a great option that could lead to long-term employment for students and the organization, as you've both shared. So uh, the uh, Tammy is looking forward to connecting Selkirk College to see if they can arrange a meet um, and is wondering what the first step in the process of utilizing students through this program would be. So um, if somebody from Selkirk is in the um, is joining us, if you want to connect, um, and if not, Tammy, um, I'd be happy to connect with you after and uh, and pass on some contact information from our colleagues at Selkirk. So thank you. I am going to move on to the next um, part of our webinar today, uh, which is where we're going to hear from some of our funding partners. So thank you all for uh, your engagement in this this part of the of the webinar, um, and I'm looking forward to the next part. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Pamela Gray. Pamela is the Vice President of Program Development with BioTalent Canada. So thank you, Pamela. Great, thank you. I'm going to wait till the slides come up here. Fantastic. And Carmen, if you can move to the next one, please. So I want to thank you, Jenny, for that introduction. And thanks so much for inviting uh, me to present today. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm with Biotalent Canada. And for those of you who don't know us, we're a Canadian association. We've been around for 21 years and we are national in scope and we specialize in HR tools for uh, the Canadian bioeconomy. Our vision is that the Canadian bioeconomy is people focused, a career of choice and a driver of the Canadian economy. And essentially our goal is to make sure that the industry has access to the skilled talent that it needs to be innovative and competitive, which is of course, so important during the pandemic. Um, with COVID-19 this year and healthcare being so closely related with the bioeconomy, the federal government asked us along with Magnet, so Jim will be presenting this as well, if we could help support healthcare with some of our initiatives this year. Next slide, please. So one of our greatest strengths is that we have built a solid partnership network across Canada that really allows us to have our finger on the pulse of what's happening on the talent front. We have about 70 corporate partners that give us access to thousands of employees across employers, sorry, across the country. Our partners include four national and 10 provincial life science associations across Canada. We're also partnered with some of the, the fastest growing Canadian biocom economy companies uh, in the nation. And you'll see on the bottom uh, uh, slide there, piece of the slide, Zymeworks is in there. They're, uh, they're located in, uh, in Vancouver. And of course, we've partnered with many post-secondary institutions. And on top of this, with healthcare this year, we built a really good relationship with about 65 different healthcare organizations that are really helping us to raise the, uh, the uh, it, it raise the awareness of work integrated learning and the student work placement program. Next slide, please. So here's a look at some of our academic partners. And you'll see here we have about 20, a little bit over 20 uh, different um, academic partners that really help us to connect with the emerging talent of tomorrow. 
Um, some of the more local uh, uh, colleges and universities that we deal with in BC are University of Victoria, uh, Douglas College, and of course, Simon Fraser. Next slide, please. So BioTalent Canada has been supporting students, youth, and employers in BC and Yukon for over a decade with its various wage subsidy programs. And this year alone, we're helping over 3,000 individuals secure work in the bioeconomy and the healthcare sectors through wage subsidy programming that is funded through the federal government. And by far our biggest program is the student work placement program because we all know how important work placement and work integrated learning is for students to become job ready. Next slide, please. Actually, it's that one right there. So um, with the student work placement program, employers can receive up to $7,500 per placement and wage subsidies to hire a post-secondary student for up to 16 weeks in a co-op which really provides that hands-on experience that's needed for the student to become more job ready. And as I mentioned, the, the, the program is funded through the federal, federal government through Employment Social Development Canada, and it pays 75% of a student's wages while they're on that work integrated learning opportunity. And we've been, uh, Biotalent Canada has been offering this program since 2017. And since then, we've actually been able to place over 3,600 students across the country with a lot of them being from BC. BC has actually got the second largest uptake in the country. Next slide, please. And really to share you know, an example of how important the student work placement program can be for an organization, um, there's an organization called 3DQ. It's a 3D printing company in Vancouver. And pre-COVID, they really did not have any uh, link with the bioeconomy or the healthcare sectors until the need for personal protective equipment happened. Um, and they were approached by the federal government to start manufacturing face shields and swabs um, to get us through. And to better understand what was required, they quickly connected with Life Sciences BC, who put them in touch with us and the SWIP program. And um, they quickly hired nine co-op students from the engineering program, from uh, computer science pro from programs, as well as uh, business and marketing programs. And they allowed these students basically to do everything. They entrusted the students to, to, to run this organization. And so, you know, the students built the hardware, the software, and um, they developed digital marketing campaigns for this organization. So the program was so success successful for 3DQ that they hired another 10 co-op students this winter. So as the slide here uh, you know, suggests, the, Steph Sharp, the CEO of 3DQ said, without the student work placement program, we could not have continued to develop our technology and produce PPE. So it's a great example of how one organization has, has uh, used this program. Next slide, please. So in terms of the student work placement program and uh, eligibility for employers, basically the employer really just needs to provide a full-time or a part-time employment opportunity for uh, up to 16 weeks. And that uh, job function should be in the bioeconomy or the healthcare sector. And I just wanna mention that the student's wages can't be used in combination with another federal uh, program, meaning that uh, if, uh, if the organization is accessing IRAP or MyTax or NSERC, they can't use those programs for the individual's wages. Um, also, the student must be added to the employer's payroll, uh, meaning that they would be contributing into CPP, EI, et cetera. Next slide, please. And with COVID-19, the government has implemented a lot of flexibility in this year's program. Um, the flexibility is in place until the end of March uh, 2021. And this year, companies new to the program no longer need to hire over and above what they would do typically, meaning that net new baseline, um, and I can probably explain this better uh, you know, in the chat later, but uh, the, the net new component is now gone uh, up until March 31st. Um, also, uh, any, any will placement between now and March 31st, uh, we can actually subsidize 75% of that student's placement up to 7,500. The wonderful thing about this program for small to medium-sized organizations that are smaller than uh, 500 employees, 
and uh, are not post-secondary institutions, we can actually pay that upfront. So we can pay 75% of that wage upfront. So there's no need to worry about waiting for that wage subsidy check to come in. Students can work from home, which uh, was never allowed before. So this is fantastic. And there's a lot of flexibility in terms of start dates. Um, as long as the, the student starts between now and March 31st, we can accommodate. Um, also new this year is post-secondary institutions can hire their own students. So um, you'll notice uh, when, uh, when um, Jim comes on, our programs are very similar. Um, one, one difference is though this year, all participants of BioTalent Canada SWIP program actually have access to our new essential skills and training skills fundamental programs. These are online training programs that uh, focus on uh, soft skills and technical skills such as reading, writing, numeracy, quality control, scientific report writing. So that's all being offered for free because of, uh, because of the introduction of these courses and because of COVID. Next slide, please. And here are some of the, um, the different roles that we've been funding. Um, certainly this list is not exhaustive, um, but uh, you can see if it's in the healthcare, uh, industry and it's a co-op and it's paid, we could probably help you out. So if you can see in the next slide, um, we have two colleagues that you should reach out to if you have any questions or you want to be pre-approved for a student work placement program, please reach out to Colleen Hayes and she can be found at chayes at biotalent.ca as well as Mary Carr with two R's, M Carr at Biotalent Canada. And also um, feel free to ask any questions uh, during the chat in the chat. Um, uh, my colleague Siobhan Williams is also on uh, the webinar and she'll be able to quickly answer you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Pamela. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Jim Babcock. Jim is the project manager for early talent initiatives with Magnet, um, and he's going to share some information about funding available also uh, for organizations looking to work with real students. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, and thank you to the A-School team for hosting us today and, and inviting us to, to come on board and, and share some information about our program. Um, I work with Magnet. Uh, Magnet is a social innovation platform. We're based out of Ryerson University, and we've been around for several years. And our vision and mission is really to break down barriers for individuals and businesses facing access to talent and facing barriers to employment. So we've been working with governments at the provincial and federal level uh, on various projects throughout the years, supporting persons with disabilities, indigenous students, uh, new immigrants to Canada, and a host of number of other initiatives. Um, and more recently, um, access to post-secondary talent through the student work placement program and another project called Campus Connect. So I'll go through our, uh, the agenda for uh, what I'd like to um, present for the next couple of minutes. Um, a little bit about the student replacement program as a whole. Uh, after we've seen Pam's presentation, I'm gonna try and sort of complement some of the things she noted and, and uh, not uh, provide too much duplicate info. Um, I'll touch on healthcare SWIP placements as well. Uh, we very much have a very similar definition on what that means. And um, I'll just start by highlighting that BioTalent and Magnet are really looking to be cooperative and collaborative on filling these placements across Canada. So um, we're really encouraging anyone on the call that has bioeconomy, uh, biotalent uh, related positions to be uh, applying to biotalent directly. Um, Magnet is an organization that's industry agnostic and, and obviously can't offer the same support and programs uh, that biotalent would be uh, able to offer uh, if you're in that industry. So um, we're really looking to complement to the program that biotalent offers um, and filling in the gaps for healthcare placements that aren't, you know, uh, specifically in, in the bioeconomy. I'll touch on criteria for program funding. It's very similar to, to BioTalent uh, with one or two exceptions. Um, how can you can participate in the, the Magnet SWIP program? And I wanna also introduce uh, the Outcome Campus Connect project. So this is a project that um, Magnet uh, received from Employment and Social Development Canada in 2019. Uh, alongside our student work placement program. Um, we are newer than the rest of the partners uh, to this program um, and we're provided with two projects. The first being the student work placement program, of course, and the second is, is the Outcome Campus Connect project, which is an infrastructure project uh, meant to connect all 200 publicly recognized post-secondary institutions to the Magnet platform. 
The Magnet platform is a, a job matching platform um, really geared at helping individuals facing barriers to employment, as I noted. Um, but we are also partnering with a company called Orbis Communications, who's been in the post-secondary space for a long time, supporting universities and colleges with their uh, co-op and, and will placements. Um, so I'll touch base on that. It's a great tool. It's a free tool funded by the federal government for employers like yourselves who um, have decided they want to take on a student, uh, but they're not sure where to start on the recruitment process. So I'll briefly touch on that and happy to take any questions there. So the student work placement program, as, as Pam mentioned, it started in 2017. Uh, it was expanded in 2019 and again in 2020 due to the public health crisis. Um, the federal government, uh, based on a lot of research, recognized that will placements underpin uh, the success of a student after graduation from post-secondary. Um, they get jobs sooner and at better salaries, uh, and it also helps local economies because it gives employers an opportunity to engage in new talent. Um, and so what the government wanted to do was uh, subsidize and encourage employers to hire these students uh, where they otherwise might not have been able to. Um, so that's really the spirit of the program is to build uh, and, and develop the next generation of talent, uh, while at the same time helping local business, um, small and large, uh, to grow their workforce and really innovate with uh, a lot of the fresh and new talent that, that comes out of our post-secondary institutions. So the program really is, is meant to firstly connect employers and students where historically they might not have, uh, create quality work integrated learning opportunities, uh, much like the ones that we've seen uh, from the, our, our uh, friends at um, um, our partner organizations on, at the start of this call, uh, and provide employers with that subsidy up to 75%, uh, $7,500 at a rate of 75%. Uh, this, as Pam mentioned, is, is set to expire on March 31st, um, but I'm hopeful that um, uh, this will be extended. Uh, it's not a guarantee, but I think given the circumstances we're seeing now with the pandemic, that it's likely the government will extend uh, some form of flexibility in this program, um, uh, potentially including this higher subsidy rate. It was originally 50% to a maximum of $5,000 uh, or 70% to a maximum of $7,000 for a student that self-identified uh, as belonging to an underrepresented group, uh, which included persons with disabilities, indigenous students, uh, women in STEM and a few others. So. Um, those program changes, uh, if they do uh, come to an end, will be announced by all partners uh, in the coming months. Uh, and finally, really give students, uh, you know, the quality work experience, as I mentioned, that really is going to support them. Statistics show that they're just much more successful after graduation if they undertake a will placement throughout their studies. So healthcare placements. Um, uh, we at Magnet have 1,500 healthcare placements up until the end of this fiscal year. Uh, I believe BioTalent as well, uh, 1,500. And um, they are healthcare being defined um, uh, rather loosely, as Pam mentioned. I, have this, I think I have this very similar slide with all of the, uh, the various opportunities that are, are applicable but are, are not exhaustive. Um, but it's really any role supporting a healthcare faculty at a post secondary institution, any healthcare role at any organization. So you could be a large multinational corporation um, in a number of verticals, but if it's a healthcare role at that organization, that would be applicable. Um, or also be any role at a healthcare organization. Uh, so an example here would be an HR student or a marketing or a business student at a hospital, long-term care facility, or a community health organization. We have seen um, a dramatic increase in the demand for all of the ancillary supports that are required uh, to support frontline workers. So particularly in those, those frontline hubs, um, they, when they bring on more people, need more HR support. They need more process support, more administrative support, things that um, are not necessarily very visible, um, but are nevertheless crucial to supporting all of the work that they do. So if you are, in this example, you know, working with some of the hospitals, um, they've expressed to us, we really need HR support, right? We need someone who's going to be able to bring our systems up to speed. We have these people who are working remotely, trying to keep headcount down, trying to manage um, the, uh, the facility in a very different way, particularly this year. So um, that's uh, important to note is that and when you're thinking healthcare, it can be um, a healthcare organization, but in a non-healthcare type of role. 
And on the next slide, I've got uh, the same slide I, I believe uh, Pam had. So it just shows you the breadth uh, and extent of, of those roles. Uh, if you do have any questions about eligibility, feel free to re reach out to uh, myself or Pam and we can check that. Highlights of the program funding criteria. Um, so employers, they must be re a registered business, nonprofit, post-secondary institution, uh, and new this year stemming from the pandemic. A hospitals, long-term care facilities are also now eligible. Uh, where previously they were not. Uh, and that's largely because of the funding they receive um, is partially coming from, uh, from government sources. Uh, and they must be committed to paying the student, providing a quality will experience. So um, I know there are a lot of opportunities in the healthcare uh, space that are not paid. Um, unfortunately, those would be uneligible uh, for this program. Uh, the students must be registered as a domestic student. So unfortunately, international students are not eligible. I know this is a challenge uh, for many institutions and employers who recognize that the international student population is growing at an increasingly rate. Uh, East Coast, West Coast, uh, uh, there is no exception. Um, so unfortunately, it's domestic students only eligible for this program. Um, as Pam mentioned, they cannot be funded by another federal source. Uh, and for a full list of the eligibility criteria, you can go to SWIP, SWPP .today. So participating in the program, um, you can go to the website that I, I just mentioned um, and create your application. You can start one with or without a student. Um, you can get pre-approved. So if you're an employer leaving today saying, this is great, I wanna hire a student, you can start an application and be pre-approved much like you would for a mortgage without buying a house. Um, you can say, you can be told, yes, you're eligible as an employer. Then you can go and hire your student with confidence um, provided they meet the criteria that if you hire them, you will be funded. The funding will be there for you. Um, and typically, uh, we post one to two week turnarounds on application reviews. Uh, we have been scaling up drastically as the federal government's uh, investment this year was uh, enormous. We started this year with 1,000 placements and including our healthcare placements, we now have close to 20,000 available in Magnet. Uh, we have filled the majority of those in the last few months. Um, but we are working um, uh, effortless or uh, effortlessly, but very, very, uh, uh, we're working very hard to bring those times down. We saw a massive increase in applications in the fall. So employers were seeing that one to two week turnaround, um, but we've brought that down quite a bit. Um, so after an application is approved, there's a few steps uh, that we require after. So you, you, know, you do have to sign an employer placement agreement that tells us that you are paying the student, um, you're abiding by uh, labor legislation, applicable laws, et cetera. We do need proof of payroll for the student. So that's a pay stub or a report uh, from finance to show the exact wages that were paid um, and an invoice ultimately. So uh, we are a division of Ryerson University. We have a few more sort of uh, bureaucratic things to, to, uh, to jump through. Um, and that includes a little more paperwork at the end. Um, and unlike BioTalent, this is another piece being part of Ryerson University. Um, unfortunately, we cannot offer the subsidy upfront. So when the placement ends, we process payment within 45 days on receipt of the uh, documents I just mentioned. And the next slide. So I mentioned how you can participate. Here's our website again, swpp.magnet.today. We're still accepting applications for fall and for winter. So if you have a student that you've already hired um, in the fall or in the winter, we can still fund those. Uh, we're really hoping that with that funding, you will reinvest in the student economy, reinvest in new oil positions uh, for the summer. Um, and that application process will be open very soon. Um, and any questions, you can go to swip at magnet.today. And the next slide or two, um, I'm gonna touch on briefly, maybe just stop here at this slide and speak to Outcome Campus Connect. Uh, this is a project, as I mentioned, that connects to over hundred colleges and universities with one job posting. So you can go to campusconnect.magnet.today uh, to check that out, create a free account and post your job. So that's where I'll leave it for today and, and happy to address any questions as they come up. Thanks, Jenny. Great, 
Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you, Pamela, as well. Uh, we do have some time for a short Q&A. Um, before we start that, I just want to acknowledge that there are a couple of questions uh, that have come in for Cheyenne and Rebecca as well. So we're going to try to get to those after, after the Q&A with uh, Pamela and Jim. So um, some questions have also come in for Pamela and Jim. So uh, I believe it starts for Pamela. Co-op programs are now posting for summer placements. Many of our employers are waiting to see what happens for the summer. Has BioTalent firmed up their eligibility requirements for summer placements after March 31st? Do you know or foresee any changes to the current requirements? And I know, Jim, you touched on this, but Pamela, did you want to comment? Yes, this is probably one of the biggest questions that we get right now. And um, we do have funding next year for sure for the bioeconomy. Um, and we are really hoping that we have the same for the healthcare industry. Um, it is my feeling that we will. Uh, however, we have not had a guarantee from the federal government at this point. So we are accepting applications. So submit them so that you're on our radar. We can get back to you as soon as we know exactly what the, um, what the year looks like next year. Great, thank you, Pamela. And Jim, I believe you touched on this in your presentation after the question was asked, which is, uh, is the funding limited to Canadian citizens or, or permanent residents only? Yes, and I think the additional category there is uh, persons with ref refugee status. Okay. So um, the, the ultimate test really is, are they a domestic student at the school? Mm -hmm. um, which ultimately I think is, is uh, only possible if they're a citizen, a PR, or here on refugee status, yeah. Great, thank you. And uh, there's also the question around, are it's, is it only nonprofits that are eligible for funding or are private companies also eligible? Absolutely. Private companies as well, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, and the two week turnaround for both Magnet and BioTalent, is that with or without employer pre-approval? For us, it's actually with or without. I mean, we can we can usually um, turn around a pre-approval within a couple of days, uh, and then uh, in terms of the application process, that can be up to two weeks. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, even for the contract. But um, we do have lots of spots left, so if you have that pre-approval, you're fine. Great, thank you, Jim. Anything to add? No, similar answer for me. Yeah, it's uh, it, it ebbs and flows with the application process, but. The review is very much the same for a pre-approval as, uh, as uh, it is when they have a student. So they can expect a couple days, best case scenario, a week or two uh, worst. Great, thank you. Um, you provided so much great information throughout your presentation. Uh, while we wait to see if some more questions come in for you, I am going to loop back to some of the questions that came in for uh, Cheyenne and Rebecca. So um, not every student placement works out as well as everybody would like. Uh, can either of you comment on what a typical process would look like to resolve problems with students when they occur? I can comment on that one. Um, I'd like to say that BCID has done an excellent job of preparing us for the students as well. So we have um, emails or chats about students coming in and what their strengths and weaknesses are so that we can gear ourselves for that prior to their arrival. And then if there uh, are any issues, um, there's a student coordinator through BCIT who works with me and they're just a phone call away. And um, typically any problems are resolved immediately. Uh, the student coordinators were also doing check-ins weekly and so they would come visit the student and that was more to support the student being that they were in a different location so often and that's really helpful it can sort of um, uh, solve problems before they even start because they can hear about them ahead of time and know that there might be an issue and and uh, resolve it quickly uh, the odd occasion where something um, does happen that we need immediate attention, uh, I have to say it's always been dealt with quickly. And um, if students need more time for the rotation, if that's just not long enough, then BCIT is very accommodating with that as well. Great. Thank you. Cheyenne, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, it's a little bit, uh, I guess, different in my side of things. We have a four-month or eight-month placement in my case. Um, I have never had, luckily, fingers crossed, the experience where we've needed to do um, anything serious, but I do know that we work exclusively with SFU students, um, and the SFU co-op coordinators would be, I imagine, the, the great resource to kind of deal with that. And like Rebecca mentioned, there's lots of emails that come out. They're prepping us for the student to come as well. So I'm never nervous about what would happen in that situation because I believe that the SFU coordinators would be able to help us navigate a situation like that quite easily. 
great, thank you so much. So uh, we have another question, um, Jim, for you. Um, what is the Campus Connect website? And if you wanna also add it in the chat after you tell us, that would be really great too. I will, yes, it's campusconnect.magnet.today. Great. Um, and then Cheyenne or Rebecca, Rebecca, I'm not sure if this is as applicable to hiring practicum students, um, but uh, when recruiting, what are you looking for on an application package? And then in an interview, what uh, hooks you to offering an opportunity to a student? Yeah, so the SFU uh, co-op coordinators will send us the most uh, relevant ones, I would say. So they've already kind of like looked over them to make sure that they'll fit in our organization. So I think that's the first screen. Um, but you're right, all the ones we get are great. So how do I decide which one? Um, I would say that the first thing, because all students have, um, you know, a good GPA. And even if they don't, I haven't found that GPA to be a predictor of who's going to be a great applicant in my co-op and who's not. Um, so what I really look for is their experience. So have they volunteered in a healthcare sector? Have they volunteered with seniors? Do they have experience with seniors? So that's really what I look for on their um, applications. And then after that, during the interview, for our job, we need somebody that's very patient um, and empathetic. We work with seniors, we're getting them online. You know, seniors, they could be late. They might, it, 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 things get a bit crazy sometimes. So that's really what we look for. And we really tailor our interview questions, I think, to reflect that. Um, like I said, knock on wood, we've only had great co-ops so far and all of them have fit perfectly within our organization and what we do. Um, but yeah, I would say a combination of experience, but really it's the interview that solidifies it for me, really getting a sense of who they are and their personality. And yeah, hopefully that helps. Thank you so much, Cheyenne. Uh, unless some other questions come in in the uh, Q&A, I am going to wrap things up because we have just a couple of minutes left. So thank you so much, everybody, for all of the questions. Um, and a huge thank you to our wonderful panelists for joining us today with your great presentations and answering the questions. Um, for our attendees, we do appreciate your interest in working with students, and we hope that today's webinar has helped to see the opportunities and the benefits. As a follow-up, you will get an email to, from us with links to resources and a recording of today's webinar. We'll also include a short survey so we can get your feedback on today's event. At ASO, we do want to ensure that you have what you need, and our website has a number of resources available to help you with work integrated learning. So we have a detailed summary of the different funding options available in BC and federally, including information about the student work placement programs through all of the different partners. We also have a COVID-19 toolkit with suggestions for working with students remotely and how to bring them into your workplace with some tip sheets that you can also share with your Will students. We'll have more resources coming out over the next couple of months, so please do keep an eye on our website or follow us on LinkedIn to get the most current information. On our website, we also have a job portal, uh, so you can post your opportunity and it will be shared with post-secondary institutions that you want um, all across BC. It's an easy way to share your opportunity widely um, with institutions that you may not have thought of. So we're here to help, so please do reach out if you have any questions. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. And I'm just going to check the chat to see if any last questions have come in. Um, just a last comment. Looking forward to following up on this for our organization. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So this has been fantastic. Have a really great rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much.